Thanks very much, Chris. Iran's envoy Toy OPEC is reported as saying it would be illogical for it to join an all-output freeze agreed by Russia and Saudi Arabia. The two countries, along with Qatar and Venezuela, agreed yesterday to freeze production, but only if other countries followed suit. Iran has only just restarted oil exports after Western sanctions were lifted and is hoping to increase its production and regain market share. The price of oil has plunged by about 70% over the past 18 months. Well, for more on this, we can speak to Michal Maiden, an analyst at Energy Aspects in London. Hello there. So it's understandable, isn't it, that Iran wants to play catch up? Well, it's, it's understandable after quite a few years of being out of the market. Now it wants to regain its market share, and this is not a good time for it to freeze. It would be the biggest loser from a, a freeze in production because all other OPEC producers are producing now at maximum capacity, so they have very little to lose from this deal. Yes, because you really would expect that these other oil producers would give Iran a bit of slack, really, and actually the focus would be on other producers who aren't part of that four agreed, who agreed that yesterday, others in the Gulf and North Africa. But a big, the big story sort of behind the oil price route has been the fight for market share, where Saudi Arabia has decided to stop playing the role of stabilizer for the global oil markets and take the cut for itself. That has been sort of the loss of anchor for global oil markets has been the big story for the past year and a half when oil prices came tumbling. It is the fight for market share and now everybody has to, to shoulder some of the burden. I mean, a freeze is still possible and, and Iran could still get some concession, so it would be allowed to increase a little bit of, of its production. Uh, but the freeze remains a very weak deal in essence. And what is the US saying about all of this? Because it's obviously the US's increasing reliance on its own shale oil, which means it doesn't have to import so much, which has added to this glut on world markets. But it's unlikely to cut its production, is it? Well, production has been flatlining. It's been sort of growing at a much slower pace uh, because the economics don't add up. Of course, if there is an, an increase, a sharp increase in prices, uh, and we do expect prices to rebound at the sort of in the fourth quarter of this year, that does add incentives for shale producers uh, to, to pump up more, to pump out more oil. But the big story and where the, the, the market starts to rebalance is actually the non-OPEC producers. OPEC continue to produce and the market is still sort of and they, they're maintaining their levels um, and the shale producers are continuing to produce but it's the other conventional fields uh, Mexico, Canada, um, Brazil that's starting to gradually come off and that's where uh, a lot of the the increase in prices will come from towards the end of the year. Okay Michal Maiden from Energy Aspects thanks very much for talking to us. The UK's postal service is one of the oldest in the world and this year it's marking 500 years of running a regular operation. It's issued a set of stamps to commemorate the first master of the post being knighted by Henry VIII in 1516. But it's seen huge changes over the past 500 years. And here to talk through some of them is Philip Parker, who's a stamp strategy manager at Royal Mail. Hello there, Philip. So when it first started, the service was really just reserved for the king and court. But quite soon after, really, it revolutionised communications for the whole of the country. It did indeed. And we're, we're celebrating the setting up of the kind of the formal service. It, it's right. It was for Henry VIII and his own government communications, his, his private correspondence. Uh, very important, obviously, to have a very efficient form of communication. And it was Brian Tuke who set up this system of post towns where the messengers on horseback could change horses and in a regular way and then move on to the next town to change horses again and very quickly you could get communications right across the country. So really Royal Mail is responsible for a, a whole array of world first isn't it and is this innovation that you're really commemorating in these stamps? Very much indeed I mean it's been a hallmark of the business over 500 years so uh, when there's been sort of innovation um, Royal Mail's been at the forefront from sort of those uh, initially you know, using mail coaches, in fact, to carry the mail that cut the time of transport between cities by a third. And that itself sort of revolutionized the ability of, of commerce and business to communicate, as well as people to go on those mail coaches, right the way up to the introduction of sort of technology, the first sort of steamships were, were used for the mail. And then, of course, the first airmail service was a, was a raw mail one. We can see some footage, some old footage of some of the parcels being sorted. And of course, the Royal Mail was considered really the internet of its time when it was you know, first launched. But now it's uh, really competing against those upstarts uh, who have gone online. How is it faring, really? Well, uh, well very well, of course. Uh, 
I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a changing environment, but Royal Mail uh, processes uh, 16 billion letters a year, 1 billion parcels a year. Um, it's still innovating, and one of our stamps shows sort of the very latest state-of-the-art sort of mail center in Kent, and uh, this can process about 45,000 items an hour. It can uh, read the addresses, and it can arrange them in the right order so our mail staff can pick them up and, and deliver them. So, yes, it's sort of embracing all the sort of latest technological uh, developments. And these world firsts, really, that Royal Mail established have been taken on by postal services throughout the world, hasn't it? Yes, indeed. I mean, of course, Royal Mail also invented the postage stamp, so sort of way back in the 1840s. Um, it it revolutionised uh, the sort of the system that the mail, uh, how it was communicated. Uh, before then, um, you know, you, you, the, the price of the mail was quite expensive. It brought down this idea that you could, uh, for one, pi one price, have the mail sent to any location in the UK, no matter what the distance was. And that, that still is this universal service that is, is the sort of linchpin of the company. Absolutely. OK, well, Philip Parker, uh, Royal Mail Stamp Strategy Manager, thank you very much for talking to us to thank talk you. us through the history of the Royal Mail and its impact on society. So that's all the business news for now. Back to you, Chris. Susanna, thank you. But that's not all from GMT. 